Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, Chagas disease is also known as American trypanosomiasis. It's caused by a blood parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi, which is transmitted by the kissing bug. Now, Chagas disease affects people as well as dogs and other animals. But on today's show, uh, we're going to focus on Chagas in dogs. And joining me today to discuss this topic is Carlos Rodriguez. Carlos is a serology section head at the Texas A&M Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Laboratory. Hey, Carlos, and welcome to the program. Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon to you also. All right. Well, Chagas has been a pr uh, topic I've talked about many times on this podcast. Uh, but as a refresher, Carlos, can you start with a short primer on what is Chagas disease? Sure. So you summed it up pretty well at a, at a high level, just um, it being a vector-borne zoonotic disease uh, caused by the parasite known as Trypanosoma cruzi. Um, as far as the life cycle of the disease goes, you know, in short, uh, the parasite's life cycle, once it gets to the, the, to the definitive host, involves burrowing into some tissues into the body, throughout the body, uh, multiplying there, and then bursting back out so that it can be picked up by the vector or make its way into a new set of tissues. And as you can imagine, this constant cycle of burrowing into a tissue and bursting back out can cause inflammation and scarring over time and um, eventually lead to uh, clinical disease. Um, classically, it's a uh, cardiac disease or gastrointestinal disease that uh, typically manifests with chronic Chagas disease. Yeah, and, and since we're focusing on dogs, Carlos, how common is Chagas disease in dogs here in the US and where you're at in Texas more specifically? Sure. So, um, you know, we don't know exactly how common it is, but we do have a, a little bit of evidence. So there's been a few studies um, here in, in Texas and in other states. Um, I'll start with the other states just because I think the Texas number is a little bit more dramatic. But in, uh, there was, I think, a study in Tennessee that found somewhere around 6% seroprevalence in dogs. Another one in shelter dogs in Louisiana that was about 6% serologically or 15% uh, using PCR. But here in Texas, um, there's studies that have shown from about 18 to 20 percent in some shelters to kennel settings where there's up to 50 percent of dogs that are sero, sero, seropositive. Um, here at our lab, we run about 1,500 tests a year um, on, or you know, test about 1,500 different dogs a year, and those tests are about 80 percent from Texas, and the rest of them come from from the rest of the United States. Um, of those 1,500 a year, it varies, but it's somewhere between 18 to 20 percent that are positive on our serology tests. So it's not uncommon. I think that's uh, something that we are trying to get out there. It's, it's uh, more common than we would think uh, here in the U.S., at least in dogs. Why do you think Texas is so much dramatically higher, say, than Louisiana, which is right next door? Um, it, I think maybe twofold. You know, one, uh, the, the habitat here is probably good for, for the vector. Um, I think a lot of dogs that, that are infected are in um, outdoor settings, so they might be hunting dogs. Uh, maybe kenneled outdoors. And there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of hunting ranches and hunting kennels here in Texas. Um, could also just be, you know, we've got more information uh, about Texas than we do other states. So as far as labs that run this test or that test for Chagas disease throughout the country, we're actually one of the only ones, if not the only one that are doing it in dogs at an accredited laboratory. So mm -hmm. could be that if you tested dogs in other states, you might find more of it, but um, we're looking more for it here in Texas than anywhere else. Sure. It's a little bit of a hot spot. So, so where, where's the parasite found? Is, is there animal host? Is, is that how it's getting to the kissing bug to, to the dog or the human? Yeah, it's, it's actually too, probably too, too many mammalian hosts to list. But um, classically, you think of wildlife such as raccoons, skunks, uh, opossums, rodents, things like that, that uh, the parasite kind of lives in, um, in nature and then makes its way through the vector into domestic species. And dogs, dogs technically could be considered a reservoir too. Although I don't know that we know a whole lot about their their ability to serve as a reservoir that then leads to human infection. Yeah. So how do dogs and people contract the parasite? I mean, is the transmission the same for the human being versus the dog? Yeah. So the the parasite uh, multiplies in the digestive tract of the vector, the kissing bug. Um, so classically in humans, the infection route that I think most people are familiar with are a bug feeds on somebody and while they're feeding on them, they they defecate. And after after the feces have been deposited on the skin, you know, a human might scratch at the at the wound and scratch the infected feces into into the wound. Um, sometimes if they're if there's a bite nearby or uh, if the if there's feces deposited near conjunctival uh, conjunctival tissues, uh, same thing, it can make its way into the body that way. 
Um, in areas in like South America where the disease is a little bit more endemic and more prevalent, um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, ingestion of contaminated food products, um, blood transfusion of somebody who, who was infected into somebody who was uninfected. And there's even evidence of congenital transmission. Um, in dogs, not much is really known, I think, about the, the significance of the whole, you know, bite and feces life cycle or transmission cycle. But um, I think their dogs are thought to uh, get shock disease by ingesting bugs. So you can imagine, you know, anybody that's got a dog or a puppy, they like to eat everything that moves. Um, and if they're in an outdoor area or an area where bugs can get to them, they might eat a bug and get infected. So what kind of symptoms do you see in a dog? Is it, is it like in a human, there's an acute phase and a chronic phase? Or? Yes. So uh, I think a lot of what makes canine shock disease fascinating is that their disease um, manifestation is a lot like humans. So they, they do have an acute and a chronic phase of the disease. Acute symptoms are uh, can be generally more mild and nonspecific, although there are some animals and people who will have uh, you know severe disease in the acute phase. Um, then there's kind of a latent period where not a whole lot's going on clinically and the parasites just kind of hanging out in the body, uh, which then manifest then kind of morphs into chronic disease. And I think that's when the disease is usually picked up is after they've entered this chronic phase and they start getting cardiac symptoms and present to a veterinarian for, for actual symptoms, then we'll run a diagnostic test and find that they're seropositive. Um, the symptoms as far as in, in dogs, I think it's focused primarily on cardiac manifestations. Um, and it's anything from, you know, progressive heart failure to sudden death. And, and with these dogs that are working dogs, hunting dogs, they might be out in the field or, or doing some work and they just drop dead from heart failure. And then necropsy and further testing will reveal that it was shock disease. Well, let me, let me go ahead and uh, dive into your wheelhouse and the diagnosis of shagas in dogs. Um, what lab tests are out there? What's available? So uh, we primarily rely on serology tests to diagnose Chagas disease. And that's actually the only test that's considered really validated for, um, for diagnosing Chagas disease is, is what we call an IFA, an indirect fluorescent antibody test. Um, it's just a method that we use here to detect antibodies. It's got the whole organism on a, fixed on a slide, and then we uh, incubate some patient serum on there. If there are antibodies in the serum, they will bind to the, to the organism on the slide. We use a secondary reagent and then uh, fluoresces if there's uh, patient antibody there. And so when you look at the slide, you see these organisms that are lit up bright green. So serology is the primary means of diagnosis in living dogs. Uh, for dogs that have died, you know, uh, histopathology or, uh, or necropsy that can either grossly or microscopically reveal lesions that are consistent with Chagas disease is also a, a pretty definitive test. As you can, as you may or may, may not be aware, you know, antibody testing is is got its pros and its cons. So um, there are cases, you know, in a really acute case, you might not have antibodies yet, or an animal who just isn't developing in a good, a good immune response might test negative. Um, there is also mostly in research settings, not so much in diagnostic, um, you know, PCR has been used to detect the organism circulating in the blood. And while if you find a positive PCR result, it definitely means you've found the organism circulating in the blood and probably reproducing in the body. A negative result doesn't rule it out, um, because of the, that cyclic nature that we talked about of you know, going into the tissues and then bursting back out into the blood. If you have a negative blood result um, or blood PCR result, it could just be that that organism is not currently circulating. So there's not really a gold standard that we can call 100% accurate all the time, but for all intents and purposes, the IFA serology test is what we rely on most. Yeah. How about treatment? I mean, is this a, a successful thing or largely unsuccessful experimental? What, what do we got? It's somewhere probably in the experimental realm. So just a caveat, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not telling anybody how to treat shock right. disease, but um, there are antiparasitic drugs that have been used in people. It's a very strict regimen. If you're in the U.S., you've got to go through the CDC to get it. Um, and that's been used experimentally in dogs to show uh, maybe some improvements, but not without also showing maybe some side effects as far as toxicity and things like that. So there's not really a well-established, approved uh, regimen for treating the actual parasite in dogs. So primarily veterinarians are relying on treating the symptoms. You know, if, if, if the dog's in cardiac, uh, you know, progressive heart, cardiac failure, they might treat with a pacemaker or something to just keep them, keep them going. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes it, uh, you know, frankly, a terrible disease is that there's not a, a, a surefire treatment that will, you know, cure it. Yeah. Um, I imagine a lot of the viewers that are going to see this podcast or listen to it on the audio are lay people or people just interested in their dogs, right? And so 
what recommendations do you have for dog owners to prevent Chagas? Yeah, prevention of Chagas disease really relies on uh, reducing exposure to the vectors. So um, there's a really good website that's actually put on by the uh, Hamer Labs here at Texas A&M. It's kissingbug.tamu.edu. And it's got a lot of information on what kissing bugs look like. You can take a bug and submit it to them, uh, either a whole bug or a picture of a bug, and they'll identify whether it's a kissing bug. But basically, uh, you know, limit your dog's access to the bug. So if, you, if they're housed outdoor in a kennel or something, you're going to have to do some kind of a pest control. Um, you know, turning lights off at night so they're not drawn to where the dogs are, things like that. If you find a bug or you think that your dog has been in contact with the bug, contact your veterinarian. They'll, you know, examine them and obviously do testing and, and work it up to see if there's a risk of actual Chagas disease. All right, Carlos, um, I'd like to go ahead and give you an opportunity to talk about the Texas A&M Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab and the, and the work that you guys do there. Sure, sure. So uh, Texas A&M Vet Med Diagnostic Lab, it's kind of a mouthful, so we'll just say TVMDL. Um, we are the diagnostic lab for the state of Texas. Um, we are actually a state agency under the Texas A&M AgriLife umbrella, so not associated with the vet school. Um, and we've got four locations throughout Texas, and we test over a million samples, or we run over a million tests per year. Um, our mission originally 50-something years ago was to serve the agricultural industry of Texas, so farmers, ranchers, people that are um, you know, raising animals for food. But over the years, we now do testing for companion animals, zoos, research, um, all, all, all sorts of things, not just from Texas, but from throughout the United States and throughout the world. Um, our test catalog is, is available online. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's our lab. We're, we've got the, the full suite of things in, in, that end in ology to help diagnose uh, animals as either healthy or, uh, you know, help, help get to a, a clinical diagnosis. So yeah, it's, it's a great website, too, for the audience. Uh, a lot of great articles, including the article that Carlos was featured in about Chagas and dogs. So I encourage you to check it out, and I'll link to it in the show notes when I publish the podcast. Uh, Carlos, any final thoughts on Chagas, dogs, <laughs> a- anything like that? Um, just that, you know, it's thanks for having me again. And, and I think Chagas disease and dogs is fascinating. Just like I mentioned earlier, the that uh, kind of close relationship that dogs have with humans they not only serve as as a, kind of a model for the disease pro- progression and diagnoses, but they also serve as sentinels for the disease. So even though there's not a whole lot of documented cases of Chagas disease in people, uh, we can use dogs as a as a canary in the coal mine, if you would, to to show like, hey, there's there's a risk of exposure to this disease in certain parts of the country, certain parts of the state. I just think it's a a fascinating use of uh, the whole One Health concept of veterinary medicine informing uh, human public health uh, medicine. So. Yeah, good stuff. Real good stuff. I want to thank you, Carlos Rodriguez, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I appreciate it, sir. Uh, Thank you. Have a good afternoon and appreciate you having me.